Busy, crowded, teeming. Iowa State University, 1962. Together they make a jumble swarm, but each has a goal and each has a place. From cheese making to music making, from setting up colonies in a bead of water to sending out scouts to a planet, here are all the jobs and all the lives of the coming world. No longer are they just college kids strumming ukuleles in the moonlight, four years apart from the world. Here they are in the world. They are apprentices to today's masters who welcome them by saying, take our tools and our skills to learn with, but in lending them, we expect you not only to learn from us, but to build from us, to outdo us. And so they learn from the world for the sake of improving it. His only problem is to find it. When he does find it, he not only studies it, he works in it, he practices. At 18, when he starts, he is immediately becoming a professional, and he often pays his tuition by his practice. No longer must he earn by just washing dishes or making banana splits. Now he works on campus in a variety of occupations. Here is tomorrow's hand clasped with the hand of today. One of those to cement the firmness of that grip is Dr. W. Robert Parks, Vice President for Academic Affairs. As we watch our students at work on the Iowa State campus in their classrooms, laboratories, and libraries, we see Iowa State's continuing effort to build the kind of educational program which will best fit the needs of our young men and women in a swiftly changing, complex world. This effort is a part of our responsibility and our tradition as a land-grant university. For during their 100 years of existence, the land-grant universities have been leaders in developing concepts of education, which I think today are serving us well in preparing young people for their duties and responsibilities in the future world. One of these concepts was the belief that an educational program should combine the scientific and the technological with the humanitarian, the cultural, and the aesthetic. As you know, the Morrill Act, which created the land-grant educational system, gave the new colleges a broad mandate, in the words of that act, to promote the liberal and practical education of the industrial classes in the several pursuits and professions of life. Another of these concepts was the belief that the new scientific education, which the land-grant universities were helping to introduce, should be oriented toward the experimental and the practical. The land-grant universities have led in introducing and developing experimental science. They have built their scientific educational programs upon the belief that it is not enough to learn about what has been discovered in the past, but that students should also learn those principles and methods and should develop that attitude of mind which will equip them to add to the sum total of knowledge in their chosen fields. Thus, at Iowa State, the laboratory is as indispensable as the library 
in the learning process. If we look about us, I think that we can see both of these concepts at work on the Iowa State campus. More careful, more precise. So they need tools, and they need practice. They learn language in a laboratory. Just as in the old days, the instructor speaks French or German or Spanish, and they imitate him. Only now, they record their imitations on tape, and they play their own mistakes back to themselves. More precise. They learn to trust their ears by testing them. And they learn to read more precisely in the reading laboratory. A machine called a shadow scope runs a band of light down the page of a book. This forces their attention on what they read. Over and over again they read, until their attention is no longer forced, but natural. They gain the habit called concentration. No matter what they're doing, they are doing. They learn the principles and the theories in their classroom seats, but then they go to the thing itself. The lab, the machine, and the practice carry them further to themselves. There they form the habits of skill and precision and concentration. And because we have more to give them, we expect more of them. We expect work. We expect it, for example, from Jim. Now, Jim is an animal science major. He can choose to go into three areas of animal science, production, science, or industry. But before he can decide, he must get a touch of all three to see for himself which one he wants. So he starts in the general class, learning the principles. Then he goes to a specific class. For example, he learns genetics, the science of heredity. He will need this to breed the best stock. He learns to run a calculator so that he will have a skill for the business end of animal science. He takes agricultural engineering drawing, where he learns the general planning of a farmstead and the structural requirements of the different buildings. And above all, he has to know animals. He learns the subtleties of judging them. Once they're slaughtered, he learns whether or not he has judged them well. He must be able to predict them as choice or prime while they're alive. He can know only from a variety of his contacts. At the other end of the campus are the majors in aerospace engineering. Since no one man can design a spacecraft, they'll become part of a project group. One man in the group may work on the fuel system, another on the guidance system, and yet another on the craft structure. To prepare the students for this work, a wide variety of courses must be taken covering many fields, including a solid foundation in mathematics. The analog computer is an important tool for solving the many mathematical equations involved in designing a spacecraft. Once the system has been designed and constructed, it must be thoroughly tested. Since any spacecraft must be lifted through the dense atmosphere, it must be tested in a wind tunnel to determine that its shape can safely survive this period of flight. 
and in the smoke tunnel. They can see whether proper flow exists around the shape selected for the craft. All over campus, all 10,000 of them with their own jobs, their own machines. Keep it up incessantly, listening, taking notes, going to the labs and offices. They fumble, they do better, they develop. Hard working days drive to a close. They elbow their ways to their dorms, their houses, or happily to their homes but only for supper, for enough time to recoup their energy. Two hours later, they're back, back in the library, which has extended its late hours. They jumble together in the reading rooms, pull their theories from the stacks, curl themselves up in the cubicles, or they take the day's assignment out of their memories and into their hands, or they stay in their rooms and during their late hours, they dredge and dig and bring up the grains of their futures. And, of course, they take time out to shake off the library dust, to yell out their tensions, to exchange their problems for a while, to drift away into beauty. So they gather for our concerts, in our stadiums, at our coke tables, or in the new center we plan. Like the world they will become, they have more and they give more. As we here at Iowa State study the educational needs of the modern world, we have been asking ourselves a question. Will the educational programs and processes which we have been developing out of these concepts help to produce the kind of mind and character which young men and women will require in the latter years of the 20th century. I think they will. In a world in which scientific and technological change is transforming almost every phase of human activity with explosive rapidity, education can no longer conceive of itself as the specific preparation for a fixed future. Rather, our educational institutions must concern themselves with developing the kind of mind and professional competence which can make intelligent adjustments to change. It must develop the mind which is alert, inquisitive, objective, and unprejudiced, open to new ideas and methods, critical, experimental, and creative. These capacities of mind and character can, in part, I think, be developed through the experimental processes in our laboratories and our workshops. Furthermore, the education which gives only competence in the field of one specialty is not enough in our complex and interdependent world. It is not enough just to train specialists. Iowa State, if it is to fulfill its educational responsibilities, must also develop within its students the capacity to generalize, the ability to perceive relationships, to recognize cause and consequence, to understand the relationships of the parts to the whole. Today, Iowa State, broadly based as it is in both the scientific and technical and in the social sciences and humanities, is in a favorable position for working out a program which permits a student's education to be more broadly based without the sacrifice of specialized competence.